So let's give a nice, warm, nice welcome to Travis White. First question, does this roll because I walk? So, I don't use, I, I one time made the mistake of calling this a podium and I got lectured because it's actually called a lectern. And so I, I guess as a professional speaker you're supposed to understand these things, but who cares, right? So, First, real quick, I just want to say thank you so much to John for the invitation and thank you to everybody here for, for having me and for letting me come here because I will tell you, this is the most energetic group of people I think I've ever heard of. So, real quick, somebody said turn off your phones. Here's what I say, turn on your phones and if you're on Twitter or Facebook, tweet about this because I will see it and, and this is how it works. So I fully expect if you're not doing this, while I'm talking, I'm not doing my job. I want you to actually be tweeting or texting or Facebooking or doing whatever you're doing, LinkedIn, while I'm up here. So please do that for me. I, oh, my hat, well, I don't have a hashtag, but the, my Twitter handle is at Travis R-O, at Travis R-O. So you just put that in there. And if you have a question for me, by the way, I love, love, love Q&A. So at the very end of this, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So be thinking of your questions, be thinking of the questions you have about the millennial generation, and I'm going to answer as many as I can, and I'll be around afterwards, so, so we're just going to dive right in. As, as John mentioned, I'm a business strategist and a generational consultant, and people go, what's a generational consultant? And I say, I don't know, I made it up. So it's, it's a great thing when you can make up your own title, and when you get to tell people that I'm a generational consultant, and guess what, there's only one of me out there. So if you need it, I'm the only one that you can come to. It's <laughs> perfect, right? So that's sales for you. So, so here's the thing. What I do is I help organizations plan for and prepare for the next generation entering the workforce. And it's not just generational issues that we have to worry about. Because right now, our economy, our industry, is at a very unique place because we have three major factors impacting business and industry and we all feel this whether we all inherently understand what's driving it. Those three factors, number one, technology. We all know this. By the time you buy a computer, by the time you buy a phone, tomorrow there will be a new version and it's so tough to keep up with the rapid change, with the rapid evolution of technology. It's a big problem. Communication is constantly changing. Number two issue is that in 1980 something really strange happened and it wasn't that a bunch of millennials were born by the way. It was that our economy shifted from being a, a, a industrial based economy to a service based economy. In 1980 we went from being factory workers and factory assembly lines to being professional people who relate to others, who deal in relationships. <coughs> Now it's not just a 50-50 split. Our economy is actually 80% service-based businesses in the U.S. That's huge. That means 80% of all business is structured on relationships. But how do we manage? We manage as if we're in the industrial revolution. As sales professionals, you know this. How many of you got sales scripts when you started? You got sales scripts and they're like, here's the sales script. And it's funny when you're training because you're like, wow, the client responds exactly as they're supposed to. The problem is you get into the real world and you realize you can't deal with Mr. Smith the same way you deal with Mrs. Jones. They're not assembly line people. They're, they're people with emotions who have a good day and a bad day, as our, as our tip was. You know, sometimes you're going to get a no, sometimes you're going to get somebody who's frustrated, and the reality is you have to deal with people as individuals and at different times and at different days, and your sales scripts go immediately out the window. It doesn't work that way. So that's, that's the second force that we have to deal with, is this shift in our economy. The third force, which we're going to spend the bulk of our time on here today, is this millennial generation. It's this young group of people that's flooding the marketplace and flooding the workplace and creating unique challenges. The problem for business and industry, all three are converging at one time. That's huge. So I help businesses with all three, one of which is generational strategy. So, 
I always say this, who are the millennials? Because people go, this is a crazy generation, the millennials, they kind of sound a little strange, they're a little freakish, aren't they now those entitled kids who still live with mom? And the answer is yes, a lot of them do still live with mom and need to kind of get out the door as quickly as possible. So, what I want you to be thinking about is I'm talking about this. If you're in the silent generation, real quick, silent generation, and before I go there, we have four generations in the U.S. workforce at one time. This has never happened in U.S. history, and as far as I can tell in my research, it's never happened in world history. Four generations sharing the same workforce. What does that mean? Somebody who went through World War II and the Depression is having to communicate with somebody who grew up with Xbox and MTV. That's a little strange, right? There's a lot of difference there. So I want to just see a quick show of hands. The silent generation is the oldest generation in the workforce. That's people born between 1933 and 1945. Quick show of hands, any silent generation in here? Nobody. The women are like, oh, I'm not raising money. You look fantastic. You look great. So most silent generations in here, it's, it's actually kind of strange. In a sales position, a lot of times you'll find silent generation in there because it's one of those professions that they really enjoy and that they can continue to do long after the quote-unquote retirement age. They still make up 15% of the U.S. workforce. That's crazy. After that, you have baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. Quick show of hands, baby boomers. Women, you can be at Gen X if you want. So, a lot of baby boomers in the group. After the, they make up about 33% of the U.S. workforce. At their peak, about 82 million in size, they're actually down to about 78 million and continuing to shrink. Sorry for the bad news. But this is, this is how it works. <laughs> Funny how this all ebbs and flows. So, so that's, that's right now. They're 33% of the U.S. workforce. Under them, Gen X. Gen X is 1965 to 1976. So quick show of hands, Gen X in the room. Lots of you. Lots of Gen X in the room. Surprisingly, only 18% of the U.S. workforce, and that's as big as they're going to get. That's as big or at their peak working age. That's as large as they're going to get. Below that is Gen Y or Millennials, and that's 1977 to 1995. 1977 to 1995. Quick show of hands, Millennials in the room. Awesome. So, so here's the crazy part. They're already 34% of the U.S. workforce. You want to know what's crazy? Half of them aren't out of high school and college. In three short years, they're going to be 50% of the U.S. workforce. In about five to ten years, about 60 to 65% of the U.S. workforce. You want to know who has the highest lifetime value for you as a sales professional from today forward? The millennial generation. They're the ones that are going to be making the decisions. They're the ones that are going to be writing the checks. They're the ones that you're going to be dealing with on the same side of the table and on the opposite side of the transaction. That's why this is important to understand. It is a very large generation, and it's going to have a huge impact on the way we do business from today forward. And it's not shrinking. It's a, actually it's a growing generation because of immigration and a few other factors. If you're not aware of how they think and how they operate, it's going to be very difficult for you to relate to them. And we all know this as sales professionals because I have to sell myself too. I have to know who's on the other side, what needs can I solve, and how do I meet those. That's, that's what sales is about. And so you have to understand, as John said, who you're dealing with. So today, what we're going to do... And and we are going to breeze through this. And I apologize. I have less time than I usually get when I speak to an organization or speak to a group. So we're only going to be able to co cover just a few traits. But I want to cover three character traits of this generation. And believe me, there's probably about 15 or 20 that we could go through. But we're going to land on three of them today. And I'm going to tell you how they impact either working with them or selling to them or being sold by them. And, and you'll have insight on all different components of how this works in your profession. So the first trait I want you to be aware of is that they are, they view business transactions or they view business as very transactional. I've talked to a lot of salespeople in different industries and different organizations. It used to be, and they've, they've come up and they've told me, they said, when I started in my career, it would take me sometimes two or three years to get into the door of an organization, but when I was in, 
it was, I was in, I was going, our company was in because there was a sense that by doing business with us, you have our loyalty and you have our, our faith and our tr trust and you would have to break that in order to lose the business. That's why it took you two, three or four years to get in the door. The problem is we're dealing with a generation that does not view business in the same way. Everything is a transaction and it's a one-time transaction. If you want their loyalty, you have to re-earn it as often as you want it. If you want their loyalty next week, you've got to earn it next week. If you want their loyalty next month, you've got to earn it next month because they are very quick to shift and to go from one company or one service provider to another. Here's an example. John mentioned I grew up in California, and I did. John mentioned that I went to UFC, and I did for one semester. <laughs> in our conversation, we never had a chance to get to the point where I dropped out in 1998. I ended up going back later, finishing my degree, for those who care. And, and so I did, I did go back and finish my degree. But what was happening in 1998? The tech boom. What did I know how to do? Program. Where could I make more money? Sitting in a classroom at USC or sitting in, a, in an office in a technology company? It was a technology company. Since I quit or dropped out of school in 1998, including going back to school and doing that in the 2000s, but in 13 years, I've held 10 different positions and started three different companies. Some of the older people had just had a heart attack. <laughs> I can't imagine, because to them, how did they grow up? They grew up with maybe changing jobs two or three times in their entire career, and that was rare. That was a freak accident if that happened, because you got out of school if you even went to college in some of the older generations, and you were with the company for 30, 40, 50 years. You got the nice gold watch. You went into the sunset. You bought an RV and you traveled around the country. <laughs> that, was, that was life. And you did it on your retirement package. Our generation goes, we grew up with our parents, watching our parents get offshore, downsized, outsourced, corporate scandal corrupted, out of their retirement savings. And we're going, if the companies are not loyal to them, why are we going to be loyal to the company? It doesn't register. This is what we grew up with. And so we're looking at it going, business is transactional, even my employment is transactional. Does that mean I won't climb a corporate ladder? No, it just means I'll climb seven of them, jumping from rung to rung in different industries and different organizations, because every two or three years, I'll find a new company that can train me, teach me something different. In fact, it's estimated, and I think it's low, it's estimated that our generation will change jobs 12 times over their career. 12 times. I already beat that. But 12 times, see, they didn't interview me, it would be like 20. But, so 12 times, and I think it's probably going to be closer to 15 when it's all said and done. This is a very different generation. So when you're selling to them, what you have to realize, what you have to keep in mind, is did you earn their business? Yes. Is it done? No, because they are perfectly fine to go elsewhere the minute you stop servicing them, the minute you stop being there for them on a regular basis. I own a small business. I have for years. I own a few of them, as you found out. And here's the thing about owning a small business. You have to deal with insurance agents. I hate insurance. I hate insurance. If you're an insurance agent, I'm sorry. I don't get it, I don't understand it, and God bless my wife, she handles it all for me. But here's the problem, we've changed in search agents probably six times. Every time we were up for a renewal, we just said, well, we should call a few different insurance agents, see if we can get a better policy, because we didn't know what our guy was doing, or gal, is some of more. And so we would continue to change. Finally, we got a recommendation, and we called, we called this guy, signed up with him, Thought, that's great. <laughs> it's been nice doing business with you. I'll, I'll talk to somebody else next time. And a strange thing happened. About two months after we signed up on the policy, he emailed and he said, by the way, I just want to let you know some changes that are taking effect based off of some health issues that your wife has had and based off of some things that are happening. This is going to impact your policy, but don't worry, I'm actually talking to three other companies. I think I can get you a reduced rate from what you currently have based off of some changes in their policy. We've been with this guy now for two and a half years, and we're not going anywhere because of how he understands earning that relationship on an ongoing basis. He didn't pass this off to an account manager. 
And, and I know some organizations are set up where you do the sale, and then you pass them off to the account manager. That's fine. But understand that you're still the person that they built that relationship with, and you're still the person that they want to have that relationship with. You're the one they trusted enough to get them in the door, and if you're not there for them after the sale, they're gone. That's how they think. So, characteristic number two. <laughs> I was talking with Candace about this. We are opinionated collaborators. Opinionated collaborators, you're like, opinionated collaborators. Yes, we have an opinion and we collaborate with people. That's how we operate. And Candace was saying, she goes, we're entitled. And it's like, yes, we are entitled. We are a very entitled generation and we're entitled to our opinion and you are entitled to hear our opinion. That's how we think about this. And, and it's true, we, we have opinions. Why? We were the most coddled generation ever. We, again, some of us still live with mom and dad in the basement, and mom and dad, please kick us out if you are in this room, and, and we are living with you, please kick us out. So here's the thing. We grew up being told you are special, you are unique, you're an individual, your ideas, your, who you are matters. Sweetie, you are so special. We got trophies for 26th place in our swimming competition. And that was last place. I mean, this is, this is who we were. We were raised with this idea that we mattered and were special. And we grew up in teams and we didn't compete against each other, which is why we got trophies for 26th place. We grew up collaborating with one another. And so what happens is we get into the workforce, and how many of you were trained this way? You were trained by you walked into the door, and they said, here's the phone book, here's our product, start at A. I mean, that's how a lot of sales professionals were trained. You do that with a millennial, they're going to have a seizure. That's not, how they, that's not how they process information. They need to be guided. They need to be in a team environment where they're brought along. Who are our mentors? If you ask the millennial generation, who are your heroes? They don't say sports stars, they don't say anybody famous, they don't say the president. Mom and dad, that's who our heroes are. Our heroes are our parents, because our parents guided us, they trained us, they taught us, they came alongside of us, so did our teachers and our parents. It's about that guiding, mentoring relationship. And yet what happens, we get into the real world, as some people would wish we would actually live in, we get into the real world, and what, and what actually goes on? We don't get that. The same people who gave that to us growing up get frustrated when we come into the workforce and ask for it from them. But this is where it's going. It's got to shift from just, welcome to the team, here's the phone book, to welcome to the team, let me guide you through this process, let me show you how this is going to be done because we're built on that team collaboration and valuing our opinion and letting us give our opinion. Here's a great tip. They will rip your sales process apart and complain about it every step of the way if you don't do this one thing at the very beginning. And I can fix this for you forever. When they walk in, I want you to say, here's the thing, I'm gonna show you how we do it and then I'm gonna ask you to do it this way, but while you're doing it this way, I want you to think of ways we can improve this. You just gave them permission to be themselves in a very structured, boundary-set way. But here's the tip. You don't have to do what they say. They just want to give their opinion. Now, if it's a good idea, I recommend you do what they say. But if it's not a good idea or if there's a legal... Because sometimes, look, they don't understand that there are legal reasons that you have to do certain things. But when they come back and they go, gosh, if I didn't have to input this information into the system, I could save hours of my week and sell more. And you go, that's fantastic. I understand why you would say that, but legally it has to be there, not because we want to do it either, but because the state says we have to, because X governing board says we have to. Then they go, oh, okay, at least I now understand. That's how this works. So you give them permission, but you give them boundaries. Now, when you're selling to them, it's a whole different thing. Knowing that they're opinionated collaborators, you, you get to know two things. Number one, they have an opinion about your product and your competitor's product. And if you don't ask them what that is, you're losing out on some key valuable information. They want to tell you what they think about your product, and they want to tell you what they think about your competitor's product and how they meet their needs. And they will share it with you gladly. 
They've been asked to thumb up, thumb down, like, five star, four star, three star, comment on this blog, give us your feedback, give us your opinion, we care. And if you don't do that, you're losing out on a valuable opportunity to capitalize on that information and really learn about your competition from a group that's very willing to share. I learned more about my competition and even the companies that I'm trying to get into from their millennial employees than I do from anybody else because they will tell me everything. I have somebody who's trying to get me into a company out here, big Fortune 500 company, she's 26. She sends me internal emails, which probably isn't legal, but she sends me internal emails saying, hey, here's what's going on, here's events coming up, here's stuff that you need to be aware of, so that I'm more prepared to get into that organization. She's very willing to help because she's a collaborator, because she wants to collaborate. On top of that, if you're dealing with somebody who maybe, say, writes the checks and they're 34, 33, 32, somewhere in that range they write the checks, just know that even though they are the quote-unquote decision maker, they are not the only decision maker in that company. They value their team's opinion more than any other generation because their team is their heart. It's their lifeblood in an organization. It's who they value more than anybody else. So they will listen to you, but they will take it back to the team, and their team has an equal, valid input into their decision-making process, and they'll tweet about you, and they'll email you, and they'll search for you online, and they'll read reviews. They will do so much more research than previous generations because they grew up doing it. So, if you want to make an impression on a millennial who's on the other side of the transaction, do this. Walk in and as you're talking to them, as you're giving them the pitch for your product or service, you say, you know what, I would love to meet your team. I would love to know who you value in this organization, who you would like to bring in, and I would love to just let them ask me questions. I would love to answer whatever questions they have. I want to get to know not just you, but your team and who they are and who these people are that you're working with because they know that their decision does not just impact their lives. It impacts the lives of everybody that they're responsible for and everybody that they consider a teammate. Why would they ever make an autonomous decision like that? They wouldn't. They're going to ask for the opinion of everybody else. So, third thing. And this is the final thing, and this is the thing that most people are familiar with. Communication is very, very different with this generation. So, how many people remember party lines? <laughs> <laughs> the millennials in the room are going, what's a party line? <laughs> so, so here's the thing. A lot of you remember party lines, because the telephone, it was really a special invention. It was a wonderful invention. And so, the ability to communicate with people changed with the telephone. And so for older generations, that is the technology that you use to do your sales, to do your communication is technology. And what you can't figure out is these kids walk around with these phones like this, pressing buttons on a phone rather than like this. And, you, and if you're a parent of a millennial, you've gotten that cell phone bill and you've received that shock. If you didn't know already to get unlimited texting, you do now. So, so here's the thing, they walk around like this and they communicate with the world through their smartphones, but they could say, look, give me the smart, forget the phone. They don't use the phone in the same way. They don't even like the phone. The last resort is to actually get on the phone, and if you've ever tried calling your kids, you've figured this out. Because you'll call them, and it will go to voicemail, and you will send them a text, and they will respond instantly. They <laughs> <laughs> just called you on that phone. Why didn't you pick it up? And that's, but that's, they communicate so very differently from previous generations, and it's changing how organizations have to communicate. Because remember, business right now is done through two primary forms of communication, phone and email. That fits for the two generations who are currently in charge, the two generations being the silent generation and the baby boomers. Those are the two in charge, and those are the two that are most comfortable on the phone and most comfortable with email. It's flipped for the millennial generation. The last resort is the phone. The phone is reserved for talking to mom, talking to wife, talking to girlfriend or boyfriend or husband, and that's about it. They don't get on the phone with very many people because it seems like a time waste. It goes into the spiral of conversation about, how was your day? My day was great. How's the weather? The weather's pretty darn good. And, you know, it, it's all over the map, and they don't view it as efficient. Instead, they view short-form, quick-burst communication as the best form of communication, the most effective and efficient in business where you're trying to be effective and efficient. 
So their tendency is going to want to text your 65-year-old client. I recommend you train them not to do that. But if you're working with them, what you want to figure out how to do is how can you get yourself into those forms and channels of communication with your younger clients? So does that mean you start texting your younger clients? No. But does that mean that you start to try and find opportunities to maybe connect with them on Twitter? To connect with them on Facebook, to actually get an instant messaging program like Skype or Gchat or IM. And if you have no idea what I just said, find one of the millennials who raised their hand. They will be happy to show you because we collaborate, we teach, and that's how we do it. So we'll be more than happy to show you. But what you want to find a way to do is start learning new forms of communication and actually integrating them into your business. Now, internally, there's got to be give and take on both sides. Both sides have to flex. Both sides have to bend. Both sides have to somewhat meet in the middle, understanding, though, at all times, that communication is rapidly moving forward and it's not moving back towards party lines. It's constantly evolving and it's constantly shifting. So some people are like, crap, I missed the party lines. So they're disappointed about that, but it's true. So what you want to do is you want to find a way of continuing the conversation and the technology moving forward with the evolution of technology. Use, use it to your advantage because other sales professionals are really struggling to do that. Those that make this shift have a huge leg up on the competition. Now, when you're working with a client, what you want to do is you've got to bend 100% in their direction. If you're working with a lead, if you're working with a prospect, you know this. It's not how you want to be communicated with, it's how they want to be communicated with. And people go, well, how do I know? Ask. Ask. They'll tell you. Remember, they're opinionated. They want, to, they want you to ask their opinion. So ask them, how would you like me to communicate with you? Try this on for size. Next time you're talking with them and you have just a short bit of information, go, hey, can I just shoot that over to you in a text message? Holy, yeah. They're going to be so surprised that you've offered to engage with them in a way that they're not used to engaging that you're going to set yourself apart and you're going to, in their minds, they're going to go, this person, this gal, this guy is different. They get me. They get my generation. They get my needs. So find ways of integrating new forms of communication into your sales process. Don't just rely on phone and email and they get frustrated when you get dead air. They don't see those forms of communication in the same way. Now, don't abuse the other ones because they'll shut you out immediately. But if you don't abuse it and you use it responsibly and you understand how they want to be communicated with, you have a big leg up on your competition. So we're gonna, I'm just going to recap real quick. We're going to dive into some Q&A. The three points, number one, they are a very transactional generation by nature. You've got to re-earn their loyalty on an ongoing basis. Number two, they are opinionated collaborators. Find ways of harnessing their willingness and their desire to give an opinion on both your internal processes and on your services and your product so that you can improve it and that you can gain their respect and their loyalty on an ongoing basis. Number three, they are very, very different in how they communicate. And that's okay. Understand that this is the direction that it's heading and find ways of getting it up ahead of your competition. Because I will tell you, my clients, the people that I work with that get this, are light years ahead of their competition, are light years ahead of people, and they're at the <coughs> forefront of capitalizing on this next generation. So with that said, let me just say this. If what I'm saying, if, you, if it resonates and you're going, oh my gosh, yes, I get this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just a small fraction of what this generation holds and the understanding that's going to be required to, to really benefit from the shift that's happening in business. If you would like to see this in your organization, please come up to me afterwards. I would love to talk with you about how we can make that happen because organizations that do do this set themselves apart in ways that you can't even imagine from their competition. So with that, let me say thank you, and uh, let's field some questions. Yes. Um, so, saying what you want, what you said, it was phenomenal. By the way, you did an incredible job. Helping, thank you. You know, us understand. But um, how do you learn, or, or what's the proper way to ask in a business environment 
your customer, you know, most of the time they don't have their cell phone number where you can text them. So how do you get that information so that you can communicate in a level that, that's more user friendly for them as your customer? You're saying you don't have their cell phone number? Well, you might. If you're just meeting a customer for the first time and you want to take that process further, I mean, how do you stay, you know, professional and, and gather that information to be able to communicate to them at their level if you know their, you know, millennialist or, or whatever. It's actually a really good question because it's it's a new it's a new standard and it feels intrusive. Right. By default, it feels like you're asking for information that seems awkward. To them, it's not awkward. To them, it, and, and this is why you've got to be really careful, not you personally, but all of us have to be really careful to not evaluate how others are going to respond based off of how we would respond to the same question. If you, if you ask me to friend me up on Facebook, I'm like, sure, absolutely, that's totally fine. If you ask my mom to friend her up on Facebook, she's going to go, I have no idea who you are, you're yeah. so, Way, uh, and she's she kind of creeped out by that. I mean, she's really not even on Facebook. I'm like, mom, get on Facebook. But but here's the they, they view it very differently, and so it's very easy to project onto a different generations. So more often than not, I don't even have an office phone. I have a cell phone. You'll find more and more with our generation that we don't have office lines. We just have one phone number, and it's our cell phone. Now, does that automatically give you permission to? Text us? Right. Not necessarily. Exactly. And this is the big question. So what you can do is you can start bringing it up in a conversation where you can say, look, here's my cell number. If you need anything, shoot me a text message. You invite them into you text messaging first. And then as you're talking back and forth with them through various conversations, just say, do you mind if I send this information to you in a text? I don't want to waste your time. It would be a lot easier if I just shoot you that person's information in a text message. Now what you're doing, you're not saying, can I just randomly text you? You're saying, can I provide value in a text message that I would like to send you? But what that does is it gives you permission to continue to provide value to them via text very carefully. But you, and, and same with instant messaging. Go, hey, are you on, are you on Skype? Are you on Gchat? Are you on AIM? Are you on MSN? You know, what, how do you, do you, can I connect up with you there? Here's my, if you want to connect up with me, here's my information. So you give them your information, invite them to connect up with you. You may be surprised how many do. And on top of that, Twitter is public for everybody. You can follow anybody. It's the greatest spy tool ever invented. It really is. You can follow your competitors. You can follow your clients. You can follow anybody and really figure out what's going on in their mind. Do they like sports? Are they a big Titans fan? Hey, you know what? I get tickets to the Titans. I'm going to reach out with some Titans tickets. And I will tell you, I know people who've closed business by finding out that somebody was a fan of a sport and then just sending them information and going, hey, I just came across two tickets. I can't use them. Here you go. I know you're a Titans fan. That was huge. That closed the sale. Closed the sale. Great question. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, you said America moved from a, an industrial economy to a service economy in 1980. Yes. What was the shift? What caused that shift from 1980? Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually a really great question. It's cheaper to manufacture overseas. And it has been for a very long period of time. And service-based businesses, but the education in America lended itself more towards management positions rather than to frontline employee positions. So what started to happen is after the Industrial Revolution, after World War II, after all of that, it's a big long story, I'm not going to give you the whole history, but basically what ends up happening is that the cost of manufacturing in the U.S. continued to go up, while the cost of managing workers across in a different country or overseas or in different parts of the world became cheaper and cheaper, and people getting more and more educated created the opportunity to go, we have more managers that are trained to be managers than we have people who are trained to be frontline employees, and the pay scale is so rapidly different that more people want to be managers than want to be actual assembly line workers. And so it started shifting more off seas, more over offshore, all that stuff. Big long story, but basically in 1980, it switched from being, let's say, 51 manufacturing to 49 uh, uh, service to 51, 49 the other way, and then it just continued to grow from there. Because at one point, we were, I think, about 85 or 90% manufacturing industry. It was huge. 
It's a big part, but in a hundred years, it pretty much flip-flopped the other way. Great question. Anybody else? Yes. Along those lines about what happened in 1970, what happened in 1977 that created this Gen Y group? Oh, fantastic question. The question is basically, and I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to reframe your question just a little bit, is where do we know where the boundary lines are for the various generations? How do we determine them? Baby boomers are pretty well set. Silent generation, pretty well set. I mean, it's kind of, that's the, the expectation because of how those generations delineated with a thing called World War II. So it was pretty easy to, to factor where that happened. Part of what we do is we use uh, factors or shared social experiences, shared cultural experiences, to define how a generation may think, look, act, or feel. Doesn't mean that everybody thinks or acts or feels the same way. But what happened right around 1977 is that you had Jimmy Carter, Watergate, a few other things, and, and it's also an ability to understand. So in 1986, there was a shuttle Challenger explosion. How many people remember the shuttle Challenger explosion? So here's what happens. That was about the first major cultural event that a younger generation could conceptually understand. Those were about 1977 to 1980 could kind of start to understand that this is a big deal. This is important. We were watching it in school when it occurred. And so that was the first of our shared cultural experiences and how we started to process as not adults, but adult topics, adult things. Younger generations like Gen X could process Watergate, could process some of those other things that we don't, we just read about in a textbook. Then on the flip side, and why I stopped it at 1995, is what was the big thing that happened in 2001? <coughs> So if you were six, you could kind of understand this is a big deal. If you were one, it didn't matter. You're just going to read about it in a textbook and go, I was born one year before that happened. I won't have any frame of reference with it. So we kind of use, could you conceptually understand the shuttle Challenger explosion? Could you conceptually get something out of what happened on 9-11? Those are the bookends. So people who have some of those shared experiences are going to look, think, and act, and feel similar ways. It's not a box, it's not a straight grid, it's not something that people are guaranteed to respond this way, but they're guidelines and insights and clues into a generation of how they think. So it's a great question. And by the way, 1977 and 1995 are the dates used by the Pew Research Center, and it's also on Wikipedia. So if it's on Wikipedia and the internet, it must be true. Right? So that's how we do it. Yeah. Yes? One more question. Um, a lot of us are baby boomers, and that my son is moving out later this month. <laughs> 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 Good. The question that I have is, we have a lot of experience um, in our lives and could add value for this next generation of leaders coming along. What are some of the things outside of asking uh, their opinions, what other things can we bring to the table that will add value for this next Generation. Spectacular question. And that is, how as baby boomers do you add value to a younger generation that doesn't seem to necessarily want to listen? And this is the challenge. They actually do want to listen, they just don't want to listen in the way that we generally try and communicate in the workplace versus the way we try and communicate at home. So as baby boomers, I really want you to think about your kids when you're dealing with the millennial in the office. Don't think of them necessarily as you were trained in a workplace environment. Think of how you trained your children at a home environment. It is that parent, teacher, coach type of mentality, not a boss employee mentality where I dictate you do. It's I explain, you can ask questions, you can do things. And, and I will tell you, they want to learn. They're, the, they're a generation that is actually seeking out mentors and coaches in the working world more than any previous generation. They're actually doing this. They're going out. But the reason they're doing it, they're going outside of their company, which is a huge shame. It's a huge shame that they're stepping outside of their organization, but they don't feel safe doing it within the organization. So what you want to do is you want to find ways of saying, okay, what are the soft skills that I can train them? What are the non-Googleable skills that I can train them? Because what ends up happening is they get in front of a baby boomer, and the baby boomer goes, well, when I was your age, I got a phone book handed to me and was told to start at A. Like, that's great. I don't have a phone. What's a phone book? 
and it's like that big yellow thing that kills trees that I throw out every time it arrives on my doorstep. You know, and they had to create a do not send me this phone book registry so that we would, because we're a very socially conscious generation and we don't want to kill a tree. So, so the idea here is to, is to go, what are the skills that they can't learn on Google? Negotiation. They cannot learn negotiation on Google, but they're very hands-on, so they want to learn side by side with you. Hey, let me try, let me fail, let me get myself back up, and be willing to let them try and fail and get back up. Don't penalize mistakes. And previous generations are very afraid of making mistakes because it's a very CYA mentality in business oftentimes. It's like, well, I'm, not, well, I'm not going out on that limb. This generation grew up with, hey, try, fail, if it doesn't work, try it again. Get back up. So it's, it's that type of training, it's that type of coaching and, and education that you can provide them and just find the skills that they can't Google and work with them on those. Great question. So, I'll be around so if you have any questions. Now, wait a minute, we can do better than that.